So, welcome again. Has anyone been at the Drupal Mountain Camp before where Preston So was a keynote speaker? Please raise your hand. Okay, there's only a few of you. So for most of you, um, we're excited to have uh, Preston coming in from the US. Um, you might know him from different books and keynotes and whatnot. Uh, yeah, and uh, I think you're only in town for a couple of hours. So <laughs> if you do want to talk to Preston, um, I think you have to be quick after the talk. You, you'll be around for, for a few hours. And yeah, looking forward to your talk. Um, maybe, um, who is using Headless already at their companies? So, a few of them will be familiar. Und ich habe auch eine Frage. Uh, I also have a question. Uh, how many of you are developers? Okay. Uh, how many people are like content editors, marketers? Okay. How many people have never built a Drupal site before? Okay. Great. Good. So I also have a, a couple copies of my book, my latest book, to give away. Um, so at the end of the presentation, I'll be asking a few questions. And if you remember <laughs> some of the content from the presentation, um, then you will win a copy of a signed book here. Uh, now, this is not a Drupal book, by the way. <laughs> just just a uh, fair warning. It's a design UX book, but I think uh, many of you will find it interesting as well. So please pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's after lunch. I know it's, you know, yeah, I've been auch sehr müde, but I'm also very tired from lunch, but yes. I guess that's why they put me after lunch, right? They always put me after lunch. <laughs> I'll just give one more minute for people to filter in to finish off lunch. Oh, no, it's okay. No, please. I'm <laughs> please. But it's so quiet. Please feel free to talk and, you know, we've got one more minute, so <laughs> Oh, no, 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 not yet, not yet. I'm just, you know, just a few preface notes. No. Nope. <laughs> oh, let me actually, is this, does this work? No, it does not work. Is there a way to get this to Oh, uh, okay. Uh, it's okay. No, it's fine, because I don't have a USB port. It's okay. No, no, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, here we go. <coughs> well, Gritzi uh, Mitenant, ciao. <laughs> Who here speaks uh, Swiss German or Romansch? Okay, sehr gut, sehr gut. Uh, well, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, once more, nochmal, uh, Gritzi. Um, es ist mir wie immer eine Freude, zum zweiten Mal hier in Davos zu sein. Uh, vielen Dank an das gesamte Team und an die Drupal Schweiz Association. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here in Davos once again for the second time, um, as always. Uh, huge thanks to uh, the entire team here in Davos and also the Drupal Switzerland Association. Um, it's always one of my, my deepest pleasures to come here to Davos. I'm here for just a little bit less time this time than I would like to be. Um, but once again, grüezi, miteinand, ciao. Um, my name is Preston, so I use he, him, they, them pronouns. I am a senior product leader with 20 years of experience in software, uh, 17 years in CMS, including Drupal, and I've been leading uh, product and design and engineering DevRel functions at a lot of different organizations. I just started last Monday as VP of product at .CMS, and I'm also the author of several books. Um, 
I'm also the founder of Decoupled Days. Um, how many people have heard of Decoupled Days or have been to Decoupled Days? Wonderful. So uh, Decoupled Days is the only, the first and only nonprofit headless CMS and headless commerce conference. Uh, we are still the only one that is fiercely independent, fiercely impartial. We come from Drupal. We come from that open source mentality. Uh, but we've decided to go on hiatus for this year. So you might have noticed that we've been a little bit quiet this year as a team. You've seen that we haven't announced any dates yet. Unfortunately, many of us are a little burnt out, so our team is going to take a bit of a break this year. Uh, we are looking for a new venue, um, either in New York City, and there have been some whisperings. I don't know if Lucas Fischer is here, but uh, yes, we've been talking about possibly bringing decoupled days to Europe for the very first time. Uh, one of our organizers, Larry Swanson, a uh, very uh, important um, figure in content strategy, has just moved to Utrecht uh, in Nederland, in the Netherlands. So uh, we may be exploring that option as well this year. Um, how many of you have uh, um, uh, been to a Drupal camp or are part of a team that organizes a Drupal camp in here? Okay. Um, do any of you use Open Collective for your budgeting? Okay. We should talk, because uh, I'm sure you've heard the news about what's happened. Um, we are also looking for a new fiscal host, a new fiscal underwriter. Unfortunately, the Open Collective Foundation is dissolving, which means we no longer have a home to keep all of our bookkeeping and our budgeting transparent. Uh, I've also written this book right here, Immersive Content and Usability. So if you are, uh, you know, stay until the very end, and I'll give away a couple copies of this book. Please pay attention, because I'll be asking a couple of questions about this presentation. Um, but they might be questions that are unexpected. So, uh, you know, please, you know, keep that in mind. Um, how many of you have used Gatsby.js in here? Okay, great. So I also wrote the book on Gatsby.js, uh, Gatsby the Definitive Guide. It's a little bit out of date. It's getting a little bit old, but um, that's available as well. I have also written a book called Voice Content and Usability, which has to do with voice content strategy and voice content design. And of course, many of you probably know me from my uh, first book, Decoupled Drupal in Practice, which um, apparently many people are still using today. Uh, please, uh, uh, you know, don't use that book if you're doing anything related to Angular, React, Ember, that stuff, because the book, in terms of the JavaScript content, is very out of date. Everything else is still pretty intact, but the JavaScript chapters are very out of date. Uh, I work for .CMS. Uh, .CMS is an open source Java CMS. I know Java, boo, okay, boo. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, Java is, of course, also a very powerful technology. You know, I, I have no skin in the game. I like both Java and PHP. Um, but .CMS is fully open source. We are um, you know, also an open source CMS. Um, I find it very important to uh, honor the open source ethos. And we have quite a few amazing customers. We have Deutsche Bank, for example, Vodafone, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Comcast, Chewy, White Castle, if you know what White Castle is in the US. Um, Great Clips as well, some of our very well-known uh, customers using .CMS, many of whom are using .CMS headlessly. So very interesting stuff. OK, so here's what I want to cover today. Um, so I want to uh, sort of go back in time a little bit. About four years ago, I wrote an article called Why We Need a New Grand Compromise in CMS. And I want to talk very briefly about what that involved and some of the predictions I made during that uh, writing process that have now come true, that are now becoming reality in the CMS industry. I want to talk about this key problem that we've been talking about for the past seven, eight years, headless visual building and editing, and some of the things that have happened in the industry to change a lot of that sort of approach. I also want to talk about what makes a CMS truly universal. What do I mean by this word universal? And why do I think that we're in, in poised for a very new era in uh, CMS? That means being deployable anywhere, editable anywhere, generable anywhere. How many of you are working with AI these days already? OK, quite a few of you. And then, of course, I want to talk a little bit about what an AI-enabled CMS and what AI-enabled software as a principle means for our future as developers, for our future as architects, and also for our industry writ large. But first, I'm going to ask everyone to do something because I see everybody, I see a few people yawning. So please, can I ask everyone to stand up for a moment? If you, are, uh, if you would like to, if you would like to. Let's do a big stretch. And let's say, Davos! Hey, there we go, OK, yes. That's more like it. That's the energy we need for 1 p.m. on a <laughs> Friday afternoon. All righty. So now that we've gotten some you know, blood flowing once again, 
let's talk about CMS. Let's talk about the content management system. And let's talk about these two categories that we now have today, right? There's been a lot of language written, a lot of articles written about this new paradigm of hybrid headless CMS, which is really just a traditional monolithic CMS like what Drupal has always been with some interesting things on top. Now, the early, 20, uh, the early 2020s, the early part of this decade had a bit of a schism, right? We had a bit of a split between what we call headless CMS, those CMSs that lack a presentation layer, and hybrid headless CMS, which is, of course, the category that Drupal falls into today. And we're still seeing a lot of personas react, right? We see that there's a lot of content that's being written out there, a lot of companies talking about how headless is still really only for developers, and hybrid headless is still really only for marketers. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some history here. Um, but the thing is, what I want to do today is I want to share another prediction, like the one I shared seven years ago here at Drupal Mountain Camp. Um, for those of you who were here for my keynote seven years ago at Drupal Mountain Camp, I predicted that decoupled Drupal or headless Drupal would become a formidable force and a huge source of innovation in the Drupal community and ecosystem. And that has continued to happen today. And not only has that been the case in Drupal, it's also been the case in a variety of other CMS ecosystems, as we've seen from WordPress, as we've seen from so many of the other CMS uh, platforms that are out there. Now, about uh, four years ago, <clears throat> uh, or sorry, about seven years ago, I gave a talk at DrupalCon Vienna uh, 2017, um, and it was a talk called Decoupled Site Building. And uh, many of us know about the challenges of site building and visual building within Drupal, right? We have the layout building capabilities in Drupal, layout management. We have component management, template management in Drupal. We also have the ability to actually do in-place editing, where you can actually click into a field on a page in Drupal and actually edit that right there and see those changes take live, uh, uh, go live right away. Now, as a quick refresher, headless or decoupled Drupal, once again, involves the use of Drupal solely for its data and its content mediated through APIs that serve that data out to a decoupled consumer application. Now, this consumer application in the pure notion of headless, in the pure idea of headless, has absolutely no tether to the Drupal platform itself, to the Drupal framework itself. And that's why we call it decoupled, because the front end that we were using in Drupal is no longer playing a part in the front end in a headless architecture. What happens in a decoupled Drupal architecture is you've got data that turns into JSON uh, within the APIs and then gets transmitted out to these consumer applications through those APIs, whether you're using a REST API, like JSON API in Drupal, or GraphQL in Drupal. Now, just to make this very, very simple, right? What we're saying is we're not using Drupal necessarily for its theming, right, for its front-end capabilities, for all of those things. By saying that we're going to turn Drupal headless, we're saying that the front-end responsibilities, the presentation responsibilities, are now being delegated to a different front-end. Now, about seven years ago, uh, I spoke a little bit about this notion of progressively decoupled Drupal, which is this idea of interpolating a JavaScript framework such as React or Angular or what have you into a Drupal front end. So that means actually inserting JavaScript, much like we already do right now in Drupal core with jQuery, and using that framework to do certain types of client-side rendering that we wanted to accomplish back in the day, like asynchronous success messages or asynchronous form handling, for example, within the context of a Drupal rendered page. And seven years ago, I showed this same slide. Uh, this is the same exact slide I showed seven years ago. There's many different approaches that emerged from that progressively decoupled era, where we saw that some people were using what's called the decoupled blocks module to turn individual blocks in the Drupal page to become governed by JavaScript rendering. Or we saw, for example, the entire main content area of the page be delegated over to JavaScript. Or, in fact, everything in between the HTML and end HTML tags on that web page. But here's the problem, right? And this is the same problem I identified seven years ago. One of the issues is once you start to delegate a lot more of Drupal's rendering and that page over to JavaScript, what you're doing is you're creating these black boxes for those of us who are not developers, right? Those of us who are content editors, those of us who are marketers, those of us who need to be able to really see and edit and manage those pages, suddenly we have given them all these black boxes that they can't possibly interact with. 
At the same time, we saw a massive amount of innovation happening in the JavaScript world. So this notion of universal JavaScript, sometimes called isomorphic JavaScript, emerged on the landscape. And this is really interesting because JavaScript is really the only language uh, actually, that's no longer true, by the way. WebAssembly you know, is now uh, also a language you can use in this manner as well. But JavaScript used to be the only language that you could run on the browser, the only language that you could run on the server through something like Node.js, and also the only language that you could run within your clients, so you know, within the actual, um, let's say, client-side rendering within the browser. Now, in, to, in today's world as well, what we see as well is the emergence of static site generation. So think of Eleventy or Gatsby or certain use cases of Next.js and Astro, the new framework that has just emerged. Svelte also plays in this sort of landscape as well, the Jamstack world, right? Now, as a quick, quick, quick summary here, right? I don't want to dig into this too much, but of course, universal JavaScript basically says, let's use the same code, let's use the same programming language on both client and server to serve out you know, HTML, serve out CSS, serve out all these things that make up a web page. And when you get Drupal involved, what's really interesting is that you can now use Drupal not only for synchronous behavior, where you're actually calling Drupal data and you know, emitting Drupal data out to your JavaScript framework on the server side, which generates that HTML page. Now you can also, on the client side of that JavaScript framework, call Drupal asynchronously and get data back to do any sort of uh, rehydration or client-side re-rendering you might want to do. Now, I don't want to go too deep into this, but this is where the idea of universal comes from, right? Because way back in the day, when Drupal first came out, when a lot of these old, old platforms came out, right, they were really primarily only server-side. You could really only have a server-side generated page that would then be flushed out to the browser. And besides jQuery and Ajax and some of those old, old client-side frameworks that existed, you didn't really have much ability to tie together the sorts of rendering that Drupal did on the server-side with the sort of things that people really wanted to do asynchronously on the client-side. So this is really interesting, right, because when you think about this new paradigm, what's really great is obviously with client-side rendering and client-side execution of JavaScript, you can do all sorts of amazing behaviors, right? Like the asynchronous success messages, the asynchronous form handling, all of these things that we now see very commonly on websites today. This is now a very much a core experience that many of us have when we browse the web today. You no longer see full refreshes or full flushes of browser pages. Those are now things that are a little bit rare these days, especially on high performing applications that require a great amount of interactivity. Now seven years ago in Vienna, I showed this same slide as well. And one of the arguments that I made back then uh, was that when you have a Drupal front end and you have potentially, for example, a separate Drupal administrative layer, one of the problems that emerges is that they don't talk to each other very well, right? The Drupal administrative layer is really primarily about how Drupal renders things, but it has no real awareness or conception or understanding of how headless front ends or how React-driven or Angular-driven or Astro-driven front ends really want to do rendering themselves. <clears throat> now, this slide was one of the last things I showed as well, which is, you know, when you have a divergent front end from administration, right, you have this issue of, okay, there's, there's just two very different languages that these two uh, uh, pieces of our architecture are speaking. But when we start to think about merging those two things together, some really interesting ideas come out. Now, the conception as I put, uh, uh, you know, as I articulated it in this slide is actually uh, not really correct anymore, right? I, I, I no longer believe that this sort of approach is correct. But I do believe that some of these ideas are relevant today. Because here's the question I have for you, right? Why shouldn't the CMS also be universal, truly universal from the ground up, just like JavaScript is today? Why shouldn't we be able to say, well, hey, Drupal is great at doing server-side rendering, is great at doing all of the server-side activities that it does right now in terms of its functionality, but why shouldn't that also be the case on the client side? And why shouldn't that be something that involves much more than some of the smaller pieces that we have in Drupal, such as jQuery? Seven years ago, I also showed this slide, which is that one of the things that we're noticing is that because now there's a huge amount of demand being placed on 
um, our ability to serve various headless architectures, we're now seeing, for example, many of our clients that we work with today, if we're in the consultancy world, if we're freelancers, they want to build headless front ends. But the problem is that there's no rhyme or reason to what they are, right? It might be React over here, it might be Astro over here, it might be Gatsby over here, it might be Next.js over here, it might be Vue.js over here, right? It might be Svelte over here. So how do we actually deal with that when we have not only a responsibility to serve our developers and provide them a great developer experience, but also to provide that same wonderful seamless experience for content editors and for marketers? So this is the incongruity of CMS that I shared uh, seven years ago. Now, about four years ago, uh, I predicted that the next stage of CMS, right, the next sort of uh, uh, period of CMS, was going to require a new grand compromise. And uh, I wrote this article in CMS Wire, which uh, actually turned out to be a, a very popular article. Many people read this article, called Why We Need a New Grand Compromise in Content Management Systems. And in this article, I wrote about the fact that what we're seeing is this schism emerging in the CMS world. Many marketers, you know, lots of marketing teams, lots of content editors, compliance officers looking for GDPR compliance, for example, they're having a lot of trouble previewing and auditing and actually building the pages that make up a headless CMS implementation. By the same token, however, a lot of developers, a lot of architects, especially on the front end, are increasingly unhappy with uh, solutions like Twig, for instance, or even more antiquated templating engines that are starting to show their age solely because of the fact that they were built for an era where this sort of universal approach or this sort of client-side rendering was not something that was a big consideration. Now, the three sections that I outlined in this article were that the CMS has always been about an easy compromise. So let's go way back in time to the beginnings of the CMS. Those early, early tools that were glorified messaging platforms or glorified bulletin boards or glorified forum uh, tools like vBulletin, if you remember those. Uh, think about tools like movable type, expression engine, way back in the day, right? Those first CMSs did something really interesting, right? Because if you think about many of the other software verticals that we see in the world today, CRM tools, right? Uh, or you know, Salesforce, for instance, or some of these other tools that are out there, all of these pieces of software, all these tools, really only focus on one single persona. But the CMS is very unique because we decided, and it was really by accident that we decided this, right? But we decided at the very beginning of the CMS that we were gonna make the CMS something that could serve multiple types of people, right? Not just developers, not just content editors, but both, right? People wanted to be able to have some sort of a compromise that allowed them to engage on both sides of the equation. And what emerged, of course, was templating engines, theme engines, right? Theming in Drupal, for example, where developers would say, let's hand over some of this responsibility that we have right now over the code so that our content editors, our marketers, our stakeholders can finally go in there and do some of their own management of how the page looks and some of their own management of how rendering actually occurs. And by the same token as well, marketing teams and content editing teams, they said, well, we're going to hand over a lot of this responsibility to developers because of the fact that we want to be able to manage this in a very easy way, and you know how to build that for us, right? So my argument in this article was we need to have a new equilibrium, right? Because the introduction of headless and the introduction also of hybrid headless has led to this landscape where now both personas aren't very happy, right? Developers aren't very happy with the monolithic or hybrid headless landscape, and marketing teams are really unhappy with the headless landscape. So let's talk about the problem of headless visual building and editing. I believe that we're entering into a new epoch of universal content management, and I specifically use the term universal because what I mean is we're now seeing a flurry of innovation occur right now where people are saying, okay, this, where we're at right now is simply not working, right? Our stakeholders are not happy, whether they're on a development team or whether they're on a marketing team. They're not happy with where the CMS is right now. And uh, several years ago, I shared uh, the fact that we're experiencing a huge bifurcation in the CMS market, right? Historically, the web-only CMS, Drupal, WordPress, you know, before about 2015, these tools were really about enabling both developer manipul uh, manipulability, that really great flexibility for developers, but also for editors, right? Also for marketing teams and content teams. And what we've seen over the uh, beginning of the 2020s, the late, uh, you know, the late 2010s as well, up until now, 
is that we're seeing this kind of divide occur, right? Where the monolithic CMS or the hybrid headless CMS is something very easy for editors to use, but it's not something developers that are emerging into the JavaScript ecosystem are really happy with, right? And on the flip side, in the headless CMS world, we're seeing that editors are not very happy, whereas developers are very, very happy, right? Because they get to do a lot of cool things with their workflows. What we're seeing now, of course, and this has only been happening over the past, I would say, two to three years, right? We're talking about really since COVID has this pattern begun to emerge of both sides of the market saying, well, you know, this isn't really working for us. The status quo is not something that's actually functioning well for any of our stakeholders on either side of the back office. What we really need is to return to this equilibrium and balance that we had before. And I argue that this new balance, this new compromise in the CMS is going to be what I call the universal CMS. We'll see if that name catches on. <laughs> so in my view, what makes a CMS truly universal, right? Well, the universal CMS reflects what I see right now as the emerging convergence of hybrid, headless, and headless CMSs, right? Because in the original conception of headless CMS, what we're seeing here is sort of the same thing, right? You've got these consumer applications, which are written in React or Vue.js or Astro or what have you, but the CMS is fundamentally unaware of what goes on in that consumer application, right? And that is the very definition of headless, right? The very original, the original definition of headless was it's a data system without any sort of graphical front end, right? We have no awareness of what's going on on the front end. And if you think about it, what we call a CMS, right, is just that piece, just that single component of a headless CMS architecture that serves out to these consumers. What we've been seeing over the past few years, however, and I've seen this not only at my time at, at uh, Acquia, where I worked on uh, some of these really interesting initial projects that, bega that began to kind of look at how can we better serve these headless applications, uh, but also at Oracle, where we built out a full ecosystem of SDKs and various other tools for developers using React and Angular and other tools. What we're seeing now is that both headless CMSs and hybrid headless CMSs, like Drupal, want to be able to serve these consumers in a much more elegant way. And that includes things like SDKs, right? How can we make Drupal's APIs easier to consume, easier to extract data from? Um, how can we make these consumers easier to build based on the data that we're getting from Drupal? And now, of course, what we're seeing today, and this is especially only in the last few years, is we're seeing now consumer native visual builders that are in some cases identical to or approaching the sort of CMS native visual builders that we had originally in the hybrid headless slash monolithic world. So think about it this way, Drupal's layout manager, Drupal's page building capabilities. We're now seeing those same capabilities being replicated on the consumer side. So the whole idea of this is really interesting because it unleashes an interesting question, right? Well, what if we could manage our layouts, manage our templates, manage our page components, manage our blocks and regions in Drupal in the exact same way on the headless front end as we do in a Drupal site. It's a very compelling idea, right? But I argue also that what this is pointing towards is an impure idea of headless, right? Because the whole idea of headless is there is no involvement, right? The whole idea of headless is the CMS is not opinionated when it comes to anything that happens on that decoupled or headless front end. So the, headless CMS, the hybrid headless CMS today is now applying lessons learned from their native visual building and editing layers and applying those sorts of lessons learned to headless visual building and editing, often with identical UIs. And the pure headless CMS is no longer viable, right? And this is something I've seen time and time again. Um, we're seeing a sort of flatlining in the adoption of headless CMSs because marketing teams and content teams are starting to revolt against the lack of control they now have over their pages on the front end. Now, as universal visual building and editing becomes more common, this idea of this convergence, the pure headless CMS and the hybrid headless CMS, like Drupal, are now converging in how they serve these users who are looking for more control. So the universal CMS reflects this, this very important convergence, right? What we're seeing now is we're seeing you know, all of our CMSs, and this is true not only of Drupal and WordPress and other uh, solutions that are a little bit more established, but also true of headless CMSs, right? Like Contentful, uh, Builder.io, some of these emerging headless solutions um, are also going in the same direction. 
and they're very much converging at the same point in terms of the user experience. So where I'm pointing towards here is this notion, right? We should no longer be thinking of the CMS as just this little bottom piece here. And you see this in some of the marketing emerging, right? Companies like Content Stack, for instance, are now saying, no, 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 content management systems are not systems. They're content management stacks, right? And I want to forcefully argue today, and I want to forcefully argue over the next uh, a few years as well, that we should really stop thinking of the CMS as solely this bottom piece of this architecture and more as this holistic and comprehensive articulation of a content-driven architecture where visual building and editing are integral components of the front ends that we serve as well headlessly. Because as we know, right, the CMS is not limited to a single architectural component, right? Because when we say that we're a CMS, what we're really saying is that we're not, we have no responsibility and no uh, ability to introspect into some of these headless consumer applications. When we really should be thinking about all of these new presentation layers, Astro, React, Svelte, Next.js, Vue.js, as first class citizens, just like our native front end in Drupal. We should be treating them just like we do Twig, right? So, what do I mean by that? What does that actually mean in practice, right? Well, first of all, we now have the notion of a CMS, in some cases, being deployable everywhere, right? And what do I mean by that? Well, one of the things that we're seeing is a variety of SDKs emerge, software development kits, that are intended to aid and enable developers building in these applications, right? So you could have, for example, a Drupal-owned Astro SDK, a Drupal-owned Next.js SDK that allows for Astro and Next.js developers to build native Astro visual builders or Next.js visual builders directly in their code. And oftentimes, one of the most interesting things about these approaches is all it requires is a configuration file in the root of that application that connects together the strands of what comes out from the CMS in terms of that visual presentation layer and how that connects to certain rendering that occurs within the JavaScript framework. And by the way, this is also deployable anywhere, right? If you have an Astro application or an XJS application, you could deploy that wherever you want to. Netlify, Vercel, Cloudflare. And that code that you are deploying anywhere suddenly has some of Drupal in it, right? Suddenly has some of the CMS in it because the SDK itself is that little snippet of Drupal or that little snippet of that CMS that is now asserting itself in these JavaScript applications. Whether it's a configuration file or even deeper integration, this is a very exciting uh, change, right? Because it no longer matters where your CMS components are hosted, right? Your SDK is going out to be part of the code that gets deployed out to Netlify or Vercel, right? It's not something that is tied to necessarily a Drupal hosting platform. So the universal CMS is tech agnostic, right? It could be Astro, Next.js, what have you. It's SDK enabled, and this is something many CMSs are now providing, and thus deployable anywhere. And this, I argue, is really kind of where people are saying composable today, right? I, you know, I don't like that term 100% because I think it shrouds a lot of the complexity of what we're talking about in terms of architectures. But I do believe that what this enables is a certain kind of architectural composability that we have never had before in the CMS ecosystem. And the universal CMS treats all technologies as first class citizens. It doesn't matter if the CMS component, and when I say component, I mean that architectural piece, right? I mean that framework, that system. It could be written in Java, PHP, or JavaScript. We can deploy it to Acquia, Platform SH, one of our sponsors here. We could also deploy our SDK-enabled code out to Netlify or Vercel. Drupal can be on Netlify or Vercel, is what I'm saying today, right? It doesn't have to be something that we think about as not being Drupal. So there's some really interesting people doing some really interesting work today. We actually heard just this morning from Fabian Franz, who shared uh, you know, uh, his work on Easy SSR and Preact and React, and some of the really interesting things that he's working on with the Drupal Form API and integrating that into headless front ends in ways that make that editorial experience for headless architecture is very compelling. So if you didn't see uh, Fabian's uh, talk, um, he's got a recording and we'll uh, share it at some point on the Tag1 blog. Um, it's it's you know, something I'm looking very much forward to reviewing as well. And then there are also other solutions, right? So Drupal isn't the only place where this sort of innovation is happening. How many people have heard of Builder.io? So Builder.io um, is, a, is a company that I actually have a personal connection to in that uh, Misko Hevery, one of the original uh, team members of Angular, uh, uh, is somebody that I've met before and is one of the founders of Builder.io. 
and Dota.io, their whole idea is a visual headless CMS. It doesn't matter what you're building in. It could be, once again, Astro, Next.js, Vue.js, React, what have you. But no matter what you're building in, you can still pop out this very compelling contextual editorial experience that allows you to touch the page and manipulate the page in ways that we weren't able to before on the headless architectural side of things. But we were able to, of course, in the former Drupal and monolithic era. Um, how many people have heard of Stackbit? Anyone? So Stackbit is also very interesting. Stackbit is also playing in this world where they're saying, hey, it doesn't matter what you build your front end in, right? It doesn't matter at all. It could be any of these JavaScript front ends. But fundamentally, we can now connect individual pieces of data that you're rendering out into that front end back over to some of the other CMSs and tools that you might be using. As you can see here, one of the examples that they're showing right here is Contentful, Shopify. You could even have it connect to something that you're managing in GitHub, for instance. Now, one of the things that I think is really interesting about Stackbit um, is that Netlify just acquired Stackbit, and they call themselves a visual editor for composable websites, which is uh, very interesting as well. And of course, I can't not uh, boost my own company. Uh, so .CMS, um, you know, once again, is a Java-driven open source CMS. You can go to GitHub right now and take a look at our code. It's all open source. Um, and we have this really amazing feature that's emerging called Edit Mode Anywhere. You can actually try this out today on .CMS. And what Edit Mode Anywhere allows you to do is to use the exact same visual building and visual editing that we have for our Java-driven uh, front ends in uh, context with any headless front end that you might be using, right? So if it's in Vue.js or Next.js or React, right? We can now allow you to have a unified visual builder UI for both native and headless. And this is one of the things that I think is going to boost the hybrid headless world over the headless world that is now just beginning to play with these visual building tools. What's the reason why? Well, the reason why is because we already have decades of experience as monolithic or hybrid headless CMS builders in this world, right? Drupal and .CMS have both already figured out how to do this sort of thing on their native front ends. And what we're actually seeing here now is that the identical UI, the same UI, can be something you find to manage your headless front ends as well. For those who are using this sort of visual building and visual editing tool, there is no difference, right? There is no functional difference. There is no visual difference between the two UIs that you're using to manage your Astro site versus your .CMS site or your Drupal site. Now, this is a very compelling concept, right? And this is one of the things that I worked on while I was at Oracle as well, is this idea that for that marketing team, for that content editing team, it shouldn't really matter, right? What the front end is. It shouldn't matter what is being used on that front end architecture we should really be able to manage that just as gracefully as we do our native front end as well. And one of the things I think that is you know, really interesting about this approach as well is, is we're finally saying right, that these headless front ends, these, front, these headless architectures are now fully part of what we're considering the CMS and core CMS functionality. So the universal CMS, just to summarize again, is also editable anywhere, right? Any front end, any pager component, any text or asset, regardless of technology choice. Now here's a question. Is true in-place editing possible in the new universal CMS? So many of us know about uh, Quick Edit, that module that's part of Drupal core, something that's also available in many other systems like WordPress and .CMS. Um, is that something that's going to be possible where you can just kind of go into a production or a staging deployed page, do some editing, see that go live immediately or preview that right away? Well, the next horizon, I believe, could be, right, and I don't think this is uh, necessarily too hard, but I think there are a lot of issues and a lot of obstacles in the way, and this really involves like deep, deep, deep thinking about, okay, you know, what sorts of approaches are you doing to actually do this sort of thing? But I would love for the future to see the ability for CMSs to do edit anywhere, much like .CMS does, much like Drupal is headed towards today as well, bidirectionally, whether that means from the rendered page itself or from the administrative layer of the CMS, such that, you could have in-place editorial micro-interfaces, just like we have with Quick Edit today in Drupal, um, that are you know, functioning headlessly. And then also, of course, the fully integrated headless visual page builder and editor that's built into the CMS user interface. Now, uh, there's also a really interesting uh, kind of future state of CMS that I want to talk about here today as well. And the reason why I'm going in this direction is because there's also the concept of a universal CMS being generable 
anywhere. The AI-enabled universal CMS. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, AI is, of course, taking the CMS industry by storm, right? A lot of us have seen key AI features begin to emerge. Uh, we've seen sentiment analysis for a couple years now. We've seen auto-tagging, for example, auto-assignment of, of taxonomy terms, and so on and so forth. And now we're beginning to see more and more content generation, asset generation. For example, if you have a summary field that is a summary of your article, that's something that you can integrate into some sort of an AI tool and then generate a summary based on that. And that can oftentimes be faster than actually writing that summary yourself. Um, and then, of course, the next frontier of AI for CMSs as well, and I think it is in general for the tech industry, is what we're seeing begin to emerge around code generation, right? Now, the really interesting thing right now that we're seeing in CMS is that right now, a lot of CMSs are really kind of limited to small individual features, right? Um, for example, Oracle Content Management, which I was a part of, uh, had what we called smart content, which allowed you to you know, basically generate image assets or generate text based on um, certain assets that you might have or certain text fields that you had filled in. Um, but these are really small scale things, right? Sentiment analysis is really small. Uh, auto tagging is really small. It's not really, in my view, that compelling of where AI can go. And now, of course, we're seeing more content and asset generation, right? Like, can you write this text for me based on this other text? Or can you create this image, generate an image on Midjourney or Dolly, right, that is based on this text that I've written into this article? So some very, very interesting uh, next steps of AI. But what I argue is sort of the final frontier of the AI-enabled CMS, right? And where I see a lot of this AI generation headed is some of this really interesting and intriguing, fascinating work going on with code generation, right? Because what if you could say, hey, can you generate for me a Next.js app that is already configured, already connected, everything is integrated, everything is ready to go, and have a native visual builder in that as well that I can now hook up back to my CMS automatically, automatically, really, right? So one day, I think, in the not too far future, and I really do believe this, I believe this is gonna happen in the next five years, we will get to a point where some of the CMSs that we see in the world today will be capable of generating entire consumer applications that are headless and that are also visually editable and visually buildable solely through a single prompt within the CMS. And that is only possible if we think of the CMS no longer as this single system within an architectural stack. It's really much more compelling if we think about the CMS as something that controls all of the stack or even becomes the entire stack. And what if, of course, as we move further and further into the AI-driven landscape, what if we see the ability to generate entire architectures, entire stacks through a single prompt? Now that, I think, becomes a very interesting proposition and really opens up challenges, difficulties, really interesting questions and quandaries for us to think about in the CMS world. Co-generation, interesting stuff. But I want to end here today um, with a quick apology. Uh, many of you probably expected that my keynote today was going to involve uh, a discussion of AI and, of course, um, you know, all of that. But uh, unfortunately, I, I fell very ill uh, a few weeks ago, and I lost about a week's worth of time that I was going to spend doing uh, preparation for an AI-related talk. So uh, this talk is a little bit less AI-related today, simply because um, I was a little ill. Maybe I should have had AI actually generate that talk for me. <laughs> so let me end here today with just a little bit of discussion around AI, right? Because um, I think AI is very, it shows a lot of promise. It shows a lot of interesting uh, things that could happen, uh, in, you know, in terms of innovation in our world. But I do also think that we have um, a lot of things to think about when it comes to AI. And first and foremost, uh, related to diversity and inclusion, and also related to labor rights and workers' rights today, as we're seeing increasingly become a concern. Um, I'm sure many of you heard this quote from, uh, from Jensen Wong, the uh, CEO of NVIDIA, um, who said, hey, you know, uh, stop learning coding, right? Don't learn how to code anymore because AI is going to do all that code for you. It's going to generate all that code for you. Um, is anyone, does anyone agree with that in here or disagree with that? Okay, interesting. You agree, okay. Um, well, I'm sort of on the fence, you know, I, I'm not really sure. Uh, you know, I, I, do, I do see why, why he said that and I do see where he's going. Um, but I do think that, you know, right now, if you look at some of the generated code, if you look at some of the output that comes out from some of these code generators, it's basically like front page, you know, code or like, you know, code that is completely unmaintainable and completely unmanageable, right? And there's actually also 
I've seen examples of code generated where, where it's just not equipped for the architectures that they're trying to generate code for, right? But there are some very, very, very interesting smaller things happening in code generation where, you know, for example, uh, I saw this really interesting demo just last week of uh, TypeScript type definitions, right? Just generating a whole, you know, uh, a, you know types, types definition without having to do anything, without having to write that yourself. Um, you know, the whole prop types method in TypeScript. Very, very interesting, right? Because that would save us a lot of time. And of course, many of us also in this room, I think, have heard about what happened earlier this week, uh, where Jacob Nielsen, uh, one, you know, one of the primary figures of usability and user experience, caused a massive amount of anger and fury in the accessibility community by arguing that accessibility work has failed and that we should no longer be focusing on WCAG, we should no longer be focusing on making our web pages accessible because generative UI, generative UX should be able to do that for us. Now, as you can imagine, uh, this caused a huge amount of controversy and many, 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 many accessibility advocates and uh, accessibility, uh, you know, people who work with accessibility were very, very unhappy with, and, and very angry actually, it, rightfully so, with this pronouncement that, that their work over the last 30, 40 years has been meaningless. Um, and I, I fully, I am 100% in agreement with all of those people who are critiquing Jacob Nielsen for this statement. Um, it, is, it is remarkably tone deaf. Um, and, uh, you know, it is, it is just remarkably, uh, and it, you know, it is just remarkably um, ridiculous for, for him to argue that. Um, and then of course we see that AI just also has a lot of issues still, right? Uh, take for example the launch of Bing last year, right? Where we see just, you know, just a lot of things that I think could generate harm on the other side. If you're a user and you receive this response, right? Th th there's just a lot of, you know, sort of ramifications and a lot of issues that come out from AI that begins to hallucinate and AI that begins to, to, to malfunction, right? And of course, uh, and you know, once again, I want to focus on some of the most recent things that have happened. We all have probably seen as well over the last week or two, Google Gemini um, kind of doing some things that, uh, you know, okay, they make sense from the standpoint of we do need to honor diversity and inclusion, but also, you know, frankly, we really shouldn't be allowing generative AI to do things like, you know, give me uh, an image of Nazi. Uh, soldiers in, uh, who are of color, right? That is just not something that makes sense. It's not something that really should be happening. Um, and of course, uh, Gemini got flack from both sides um, of the political uh, spectrum um, through this approach. And you also see, I think, a lot of these image generators really just not doing a very good job of thinking through a lot of how people of color, especially uh, uh, you know, multiply marginalized communities, have to deal with some of these really not great things that are coming out of artificial intelligence. Uh, last year, the New York Times had this amazing piece that went in depth about how many black artists are seeing that algorithms are simply not representing uh, uh, black individuals, black people, in a way that actually makes sense. Um, and we're seeing a lot of this kind of image distortion that is really ridiculous, right? If you think about the fact that many of these results are simply not correct, they're not right. Um, and we just don't see a lot of change happening in a lot of these um, AI tools to really account for the fact that those of us who are black or indigenous or people of color, like we need to be able to see ourselves represented properly by AI tools. And that's simply a function not only of the fact that many of these teams building AI are not necessarily as inclusive as they should be, but also because of the fact that they're relying on data that itself is biased and itself is not inclusive, right? So it's a really, really big chicken and egg problem that we're seeing in the world today. And this is one of the reasons why I refuse to use um, image generation for anything that involves depicting people, right? Um, I do use Adobe Photoshop's Generative Expand. I think it's a really, how many people have used uh, that in Photoshop? The Generative Expand. It's really cool, right? But you know, I think that for that sort of use case, it makes a lot of sense. But when it comes to actually depicting people, we are nowhere near the point where we should be doing any of this sort of um, image or AI generation for, um, uh, for this sort of thing. Um, also, earlier this week, slash last week, uh, you know, Klarna uh, announced that their chatbot was able to, uh, you know, 
do basically the work of 700 people. And scarcely two years ago, he laid off 700 people who were in the customer support, customer service uh, uh, functions at Klarna, right? So what we're seeing here is AI is really beginning to kind of bring people out of work, right? And I think we're seeing this right now in the tech job market, right? In the tech market right now, where so many of these large tech companies have laid off thousands upon thousands of people and now have all of these open job, uh, these open positions for AI and AI management and AI development um, in ways that are really kind of questionable, I think, when we think about the ramifications of AI for our information economy. And the company, of course, said, well, you know, this new customer service assistant, this chatbot, this AI chatbot, is not connected in any way to the layoffs. Well, mm, okay, I'm not so sure about that, right? And I'm not so sure we can trust any of these um, uh, CEOs that are, that are saying these things. So uh, last year, we saw in the United States, um, you know, the writers strike. Um, and of course, uh, you know, we saw a lot of work on Hollywood stop, a lot of creative uh, production stop on Hollywood. And of course, one of the most uh, sort of uh, viral protest signs was, you know, stop, you know, make sure that you're not using AI to do anything, right? A lot of these um, studios, a lot of these production companies were beginning to hint at potentially using actors' likenesses and actually having AI generate deep fakes of these actors or even having AI just generate full screenplays and taking the writers out of the equation altogether. Um, writers generate all of it, right? Uh, it's not AI that is going to generate the next great film or the next great TV show. And I'm sorry to say this, and I think we all know this, right? We all are sort of dealing with this anxiety, with this sort of concern in this room. Artificial intelligence is already affecting workers like you and me around the world. Um, I have a very, very dear friend of mine um, who owns a, a digital marketing agency um, who lives in Istanbul, in Turkey. And she shared with me uh, just last year that she has lost all of her clients. She's had to shut down her agency for some time because all of her clients came to her and they said, why would we pay you any money when we can just get ChatGPT to do all of this for us. So it's happening in uh, you know, many, many countries around the world. It has not quite reached, I would say, Europe and the United States to the extent that it has in um, a lot of the middle-income countries in the world, but it is coming, right? We are already seeing a lot of consultancies shut down. We're seeing a lot of freelancers out of work. We're seeing a lot of people lose clients because of the fact that AI is now taking uh, their jobs. So, um, all in all, uh, I think that, you know, while I do see that um, the CMS is headed in this very interesting direction, I do see that um, AI could be a very important component of what I call the universal CMS, especially if we can enable it to generate entire components of the architectural stack. Um, I do also see concerns around um, some of the things that um, are emerging from that AI landscape. So some key takeaways uh, for us today before I turn to uh, the books, and also two questions. So this idea of the universal CMS represents a convergence between headless and hybrid headless, or formerly monolithic CMSs, right? We're now seeing a recalibration, a rebalancing of the CMS market and the CMS industry in ways that are really, really compelling and very interesting, I think, architecturally and also developmentally for us who build on CMSs. And the universal CMS, as I idealize it, as I utopianize it, will allow for all CMS personas to once again regain that control that they lost. And that's going to occur anywhere in the CMS stack and across a variety of different architectural approaches, right? It no longer matters what technology you're building in. It doesn't matter if you're building in React or Angular or what have you. We're now ushering in this very interesting era of innovation where we're seeing now the CMS get more and more involved in some of these very innovative front-end technologies. And I believe very strongly that this convergence in the market, this convergence in the industry, is going to restore the grand compromise in CMS that's the whole reason, the raison d'etre, right, of the CMS in the first place, for editors and developers, irrespective of technology. And once we start to talk about AI, that's where things get really interesting, right, because now, AI-enabled universal CMSs will allow for us to generate arbitrary architectural components of these stacks, such as entire front-end layers that are already pre-connected, already pre-configured, and ready to edit, regardless of who's on that computer. But of course, uh, AI-enabled CMS has a lot of risks, and AI in general has a lot of risks. I think that um, you know, there's still a long ways to go with diversity and inclusion. That's why ethical AI is so important. Um, that's also why observability is so important within AI. Uh, but also, you know, in terms of our future as professionals in the tech world, right? 
um, you know, what are we going to do to actually resolve some of these things? And there's uh, people who are arguing for, for example, more unions in tech, right? Ethan Marcotte, for example, a dear friend of mine, uh, just came out with a book called uh, You Deserve a Tech Union, which I highly encourage you all to read to learn about some of the ways in which um, AI and also the industry today is impacting labor and uh, uh, our work um, as professionals in this world. But I believe that this idea of the universal CMS, it represents a healthier future for content management, right? Because now we're serving all of our users again, all of our technologies, and we're enabling people to use all of our features and empowering them to build entire CMS stacks rather than just playing in a single sandbox. Merci vielmals and grazie. Thank you so much. Okay, so two quick questions before we go to Q&A, uh, just so I can give away these two books. So, uh, can anyone name one of the customers of .CMS that I showed earlier? Yes, go ahead. White Castle. White Castle, yes. All right, this one's yours. I'll give it to you in just a second. The second question is, and unfortunately, Lucas, I do have to disqualify you from this question. Uh, where might decoupled days be held if it were to be held in Europe? Utrecht, yes, okay, this book has your name on it. So uh, for those of you who paid attention, thank you so much, and now I'll turn to questions and discussion. Thank you. Hi, Preston. Hi. I loved your presentation. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll still <laughs> um, I was thinking the whole time when you said like it doesn't matter which kind of front end, but won't there be one that wins in the end? Like you see in many, many stacks, there's just like one front end that comes out dominant. And like, for example, if it would be in Drupal, what would it be then? Yeah, uh, it's a... Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so the, um, so you know, I have to, you know, I have to sort of uh, take on some responsibility here as well because you know, I, so about seven, eight years ago, I was part of a small team, a small initiative that led sort of discussions, uh, you know, around possibly saying like, should we canonize um, a single JavaScript framework for experimentation in Drupal, right? Um, that discussion did end up with React uh, being chosen, which I do think was a very prescient and a very good choice. But of course, we didn't really do a whole lot of experimentation around that um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, although we did see, you know, for example, really amazing innovation come out in the form of the Contenta ecosystem, for instance. Um, and of course, now uh, through decoupled blocks and a lot of the other things that are emerging in the decoupled Drupal landscape. Um, I will say, I no longer believe that we are in a world where one of these single frameworks is going to win out. And it's because of the staying power and the uh, very, very, I would say, picky and opinionated nature of these developers, right? I have spoken to so many Vue.js developers who would never touch React with a 10-foot pole, and vice versa. I've talked to so many React developers who would never touch Vue.js with a 10-foot pole. I talked to so many Gatsby developers who would never touch Next.js with a 10-foot pole, and vice versa. I, I know many you know, uh, Next.js developers who would never touch Gatsby with a 10-foot pole, even though those two are not really all that different, right? They're both built on React. So <clears throat> what I'm saying is that I think there's gonna continue to be even more fragmentation, even more sort of decomposition into a lot of these sort of uh, uh, perspectives on frameworks. And we're seeing, of course, now that like, you know, everyone thought React was gonna sort of win out. Well, I don't know how many people saw Cassidy Williams' blog post from a few weeks ago, but you know, she's one of the, the, the primary dev advocates for React, um, really kind of talking about how you know, React has become harder to use, it's become harder to learn. A lot of that is because Meta has started to keep a lot of that open source work a little bit more under wraps. They've started to you know, open pull requests that are thousands of lines into React, and you know, people are just less aware of what's going on in that ecosystem. Um, and that's the reason why I think you're seeing a lot of React developers switch over to ecosystems like Svelte and Astro. Um, and you know, Astro is one of those that I'm actually uh, starting to learn right now as well. So um, for that reason, I, I don't think that um, there's gonna be one that wins out. And I see this right now, right? Uh, for example, um, at Oracle we saw this, at .CMS I see this. Um, at Oracle and .CMS both, we have 
pretty much, I would say, kind of equal numbers of people who are using React or some flavor of React, like Next.js, versus Vue.js, right? And those two ecosystems are so different that you know, I, I simply don't see a future in the near term where we're going to see kind of one dominant thing emerge, like jQuery did back in the day, right? jQuery sort of won out. Um, but I don't think that that's going to happen um, with the JavaScript landscape today. And, and, and for a Drupal developer then? Oh, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, I think we still know, I mean, you and I both know, Dominique, that, you know, there are so many Drupal developers using Vue.js, there are so many Drupal developers using React, you know, like, uh, you know, there are so many of us now using Next.js, like, I, I don't think that, I don't think that it's, I no longer believe that it's in Drupal's best interest to say, you know, this is the way that, you know, every single front end should be built and, and, and so on and so forth. And this is why I see this configuration approach that we're seeing emerge truly be very interesting, right? Because the whole idea is, as long as you have like a .cms config .yaml or a, or a Drupal config .yaml or whatever, you know, whatever it is, right? And this is the same way that it works in build.io and stackbit, right? You have a single config file. It doesn't matter whether your uh, application is Vue.js or Next.js or React or Astro, it just works. It just is agnostic and just works. And um, it's hard. I think it's gonna be very challenging because you know, obviously each of these frameworks has very different things. It means that we have a lot more of a maintenance burden on SDKs and, and on the ways in which we want JavaScript developers to actually use uh, our platforms. But um, yeah, I simply no longer believe um, that, that there's gonna be sort of one that wins out um, just given the state of the industry right now. All right. Yeah. Next Frage, or let's the Frage, yeah. Last question, maybe. And I'll also, um, I'll also be outside and hang out for a bit um, as well, uh, for those who wanna uh, talk in person as well. And you're coming tonight to the... No, unfortunately I will not be there tonight. Yes, so um, I will be headed back to Zurich uh, in, in a few hours because of, um, yeah, I couldn't stay here for very long. I, I'm so sad because I love Davos, I love Switzerland, but um, I won't be there tonight, I'm so sorry. So I like this idea of universal CMS. I think it's a good path where we are going because we can see a lot of companies having multiple CMS, having multiple uh, headless, some uh, basic. Where I can see a bit more difficult is, do you see one software editor going to this way or you will see, see many software uh, editors providing this kind of technology? So going back to composable. And also, in terms of uh, personas to talk to, because you mentioned that one is for, uh, let's be clear, CTO, the headless and all these things, because they love to develop, they love to spend money on developing components. The others is the CMO that are looking at something that is easy to composable. How do you see this universal talking selling point? Is that for both or? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, merci. Uh, so, so I think there's several um, there's several things. So there's a sev there, okay, so first of all, there's several things I didn't mention, right? Um, and uh, I will share that um, I think one of the things that the whole composable term misses, right, is and I think a lot of the headless CMSs miss as well, is that many companies, especially the larger companies, are simply not at the place um, in their journeys where they're ready to go fully onto headless CMS, right? Um, I think, so uh, a few years ago, I had the chance to do some architectural consulting for a very large corporation in Japan. Um, everyone in this room knows who they are. Um, but, you know, they had this very interesting architecture, right? They had uh, multiple Drupal sites where they were using the Drupal um, theme layer. They also had, I believe, at least a couple of WordPress sites. And then they also had uh, several teams working on both React and Angular applications, right? And one of the things that they asked for my support on was, was you know, basically a unified uh, GraphQL layer that could straddle all of these different um, uh, uh, systems in ways that allowed for developers to kind of you know, share the same uh, sorts of things. As they gradually moved, and this is a very long, I mean, this, you know, we're talking five, 10, 15 years, right? That they're moving very, very slowly over to a headless architecture. What, so, the, so the reason um, I'm calling it universal CMS is that I believe for that reason that we who are in the hybrid headless space, right, like Drupal, WordPress, .CMS, I believe we are at an advantage, right? Because not only do we have the usability advantages of knowing how to build really great uh, 
you know, editing tools and visual builders. But we also have the benefit of a lot of these companies trusting us for those twig driven or PHP template driven theme layers, right? And they're still relying on those. They're still dependent on those. Um, they're not going to move wholesale overnight to a completely headless architecture. So that's number one. Um, and then one thing I want to ask, could you clarify what you meant by software editors at the beginning of your, of your question? You mentioned you work at Acquia, so Acquia is doing this. You have in the platform companies, it can be some, uh, you mentioned Oracle, so they can do that. So I'm not looking at, yeah, maybe open source purely because Drupal, I don't see Drupal itself going to this, but companies working on open source projects. Yes, um, yeah, so, so, you know, well, okay, so one thing I will say, uh, Okay, let me just, I'll, I'll do 30 seconds. Okay, so uh, I will say, let's talk about this afterward. Um, .cms, by the way, our entire uh, headless sort of, you know, edit mode anywhere where you can do both headless and coupled uh, building and editing visually is fully open source, right? So, so you can play with it right now. Go on to GitHub, check out our code. Um, but I'll leave it there and then we can, we can talk more afterwards. All right, thank you so much. Vielen <laughs> Dank.